Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we are going to explore psychic reading and remote viewing, two different parapsychological practices. With me is Deborah Lynn Katz, who is uniquely qualified to discuss both of these areas. She twice was the recipient of the Warcolier Award given by the International Remote Viewing Association for an outstanding research proposal. She, so she is a researcher, but she's also a psychic reader. She is the author of three books, including You Are Psychic, The Art of Clairvoyant Reading and Healing, Extraordinary Psychic, and Freeing the Genie Within. She is the director of the International School of Clairvoyance. Welcome, Deborah. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be with you also. You are uniquely qualified to talk about the distinctions between psychic reading and remote viewing. They have two very different histories, I suppose, and, and as we were discussing earlier, for the most part, separate communities of, of people engaged in uh, these areas. Yes, definitely. Uh, as you know, uh, years ago, about 18 years ago, I studied at the Berkeley Psychic Institute, mm -hmm. and I know you're familiar with the founder, Louis Bostwick. Yes. And uh, you were doing your dissertation at the time uh, when uh, Louis was first developing his programs. Mm -hmm. And now there's thousands of people that have gone through these programs. and. So on that end, that has to do with using your psychic abilities to read and heal people. And on the other end of the spectrum of psychic work is remote viewing and scientifically um, controlling the way that, that psychic abilities are used and, and researching it. Two very different approaches. Yeah. Well, people who are psychic readers are there to offer spiritual guidance to a large degree, wouldn't you say? Yes, very much so. I, I think of it as really counseling, psychic counseling, mm -hmm. and helping people with all sorts of different psychological issues, personal issues. And so psychic reading, or, or the lineage of clairvoyant reading I come from, is really there to help people get in touch with themselves. Sometimes it has to do with mediumship, getting in touch with other spirits mm -hmm. or beings, um, rela relationship issues. But the way it's done is more from a, a verbal tradition where two people would sit together, they may be over the phone, and they, they understand they're coming together to um, work together. And so it's a verbal practice, and it's uh, not writing anything down. There, there's nobody, um, you know, taking, um, keeping track of everything that's yeah. said and verifying it. You might tape record a session, though. Yes, the, the sessions could be recorded. Mm -hmm. uh, meanwhile, on the remote viewing end, the focus a lot more is not so much on, on one person connecting with another, but it's more using your psychic abilities, say, to find things or mm -hmm. to describe locations or describe photographs. And traditionally, that methodology has been a written methodology. Well, uh, uh, that's not exactly true. Um, there's one camp where they write everything down, mm -hmm. another where they go into a deeper trance-like trance -like state, and then they will record the session, but usually there's a monitor uh, leading the person mm -hmm. through their session. And so in that case, because they're looking at more things in the, the physical environment, it's a lot easier to get confirmation and verification. And so the, it's just a really a matter of what are you using these mm -hmm. things for. But the cool thing is that depending on your approach, that produces different results, and a lot of people mm -hmm. don't realize that. Now, remote viewing was really developed in the context of a military intelligence program, and the uh, early remote viewers, many of them were people who never thought of themselves as psychic at all. They, uh, they were soldiers often in, recruited from the army and told that, you know, we think you have this skill and go through these procedures and they discovered it w would work. Whereas people drawn to become psychic readers typically feel that they have a gift in this area that 
moves them in this direction. Well, that was typically true, except <coughs> in the, um, when I went to clairvoyant training school, mm -hmm. well, I, I knew that I, I had had psychic experiences, spontaneous mm -hmm. ones all my life, because I have an identical twin sister, and mm -hmm. we would have a lot of telepathic experiences going on. But I had no idea how to control my abilities. If someone, in fact, I once had someone tell me, a psychic, that someday I would be doing work like her, and I thought, well, she must be a fraud, because, I mean, I would never know how to, you know, tell someone something about themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was so fascinated, and, and, and when I heard that there was a class where you could learn I just jumped right in and immediately I discovered that yes I had the ability to see images uh, it took me a few months before I really started to know what they meant or you know feel like I had some control over it but I realized that this wasn't just about me there were there were dozens hundreds of people really around me that were able to do this as well but not because they were born with it it was because they went through a systematic training program mm -hmm. and this is true of both the people in the clear schools, but it was also true of, of many of those that went through um, either the military programs or, as you know, so you didn't you work at the Stanford Research I Institute? I did, yes. I did my first remote viewing in 1976 at SRI International, which was funded at the time by the CIA to develop remote viewing. But in both cases, there are now, there exist uh, multiple locations where you can get very extensive training. Yes, yes, there's um, there's many teachers out there and um, some their training is more systematic than others but in in both areas you can get training mm -hmm. and and um, I, I offer training as well in both areas. And, and you've really taken training in both areas oh, yes. extensively. Yes, I've been studying um, just every single psychic modality I could find from controlled remote mm -hmm. viewing, extended remote viewing, clairvoyant reading, scientific remote viewing. You know, I, I really feel that this work is a, a lifelong practice. Mm -hmm. And the more people we study with, the more techniques we learn, um, not, not only do we get better and better, but our different abilities can emerge through different techniques and yep. different practices. Mm -hmm. And a, a lot of people, you know, they just, this, this isn't something that most people are, I mean, we're all born, I, we're all born with this. We're all, um, I believe, being psychic all the time. Mm -hmm. We just don't recognize that's what's happening. So much of our feelings and our thinking is coming from sources outside of ourselves. But until people learn what to do, you know, when, when you went to SRI, had you ever um, done psychic work before? Did you really know what you could do? Well, in truth, I was already a graduate student in parapsychology, mm -hmm. and I had uh, had many psychic experiences prior to that, but I'd never considered myself a, a person who could do it at will. And so what did they have you do so that you found out that you could do it at will? Well, a simple remote viewing exercise. In fact, only a few weeks ago, I had Elizabeth Rauscher here, who was the scientist at SRI, who was the outbound experimenter in my first remote viewing exercise. Oh. And we actually talked about it in some detail on, an, on another program. But um, I was able to draw a very accurate picture of the target. Uh, however, I didn't understand the target. Uh, I misinterpreted it completely, uh, although the picture was, you know, like dead ringer. And um, the thing is, for me, as I look back now, that was 40 years ago. I'm not sure I ever got any better than that over over the years. And I've been through uh, umpteen different kinds of, of, of training programs. And the people at SRI used to say something similar, that we don't need to train people. We just tell them what to do, and they do it. Well, they tell them what to do, but most people don't have someone standing there guiding them. Yeah. For example, um, let's say you were, did they have you describing a photo or a location? It was a, a, real location a real location where a, a real person was there, and I began describing they were cold and they were shivering, so I was picking up on that, and there were flowers, yellow and purple flowers nearby the target, and I saw those, and then I drew uh, a perfect image of the target that uh, I then totally misinterpreted when right. I described what I was drawing. 
So, and, and what you're describing is, is very uh, common for mm -hmm. people when they're first starting out. Yeah. So then it's just a matter of learning how to get better and better so you don't have those same misinterpretations. Or let's mm -hmm. say if um, in that case, it, say it was about finding a missing person, yeah. you might need a bit more guidance to tell you, well, you know, go look over here or try this technique or if, you know, if this isn't working over here. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times we can get, anybody can get initial information. But what I found, at least for me um, and a lot of the people I work with, is there's just, just having guidance, learning mm -hmm. from people who've been doing it for right. a while. And when, when you start applying it in different ways outside the laboratory, but, you know, if I said, okay, there's a missing person over in another neighborhood, mm -hmm. you know, go and produce, you know, a, a detailed report and get it back to me, you might feel like you need a little bit more guidance on how yes. to do that. Uh -huh. um, because and I've, I've interviewed, is, is I think we discussed Paul Smith, a mm -hmm. trainer of remote viewing who went through the six stages that he learned as, as part of his military training. But to compare psychic reading now with remote viewing, my understanding is that when you do a reading on a person, you get a lot of mental imagery, and often it's symbolic. You need to interpret what that image is, as opposed to remote viewing where it, it's mostly it's an image that directly describes a particular target. It's not necessarily symbolic. Right, well, and actually the symbols that come up in remote viewing sessions where you're looking at something physical, say mm -hmm. a location or a photograph, yeah. when those symbols come up, they tend to be problematic. And, mm -hmm. and uh, it's better if, if they're either not there or when they're there, you have to kind of sort that out. But the reason you need symbols when you're reading people is because you're getting into subjects that are conceptual. Mm -hmm. For example, if we wanted to understand um, why someone isn't doing well in their career or mm -hmm. why they're feeling depressed or why they're having relationship problems, a lot of that is conceptual. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if uh, we could we could see the literal, if, if they're asking about a relationship, we can see what that you know, guy looks like and we could see what their house looks like, but that's not what they're mm -hmm. needing to know about. So the only way that the information can come up is in symbols. Mm -hmm. But even then, now once you get a symbol, further probing is needed, but mm -hmm. you really don't want your logical mind to interpret it. And that this is where the training comes in. Mm -hmm. A new student will see an image and they'll say, oh, well, maybe it's this or maybe it's that. And as soon as I hear words like maybe, I don't know, I think, I stop them and say, okay, we understand you got one image and you don't know what it means yet. Now you have to go back into your psychic mode. You need to watch the image. You need to basically meditate. Let that image so, show you something else. And maybe another image will come up or you'll get a thought or you'll get a feeling. Even then it's not, mm -hmm. okay, this is the answer. It's like, now I have more information. So it's a constant probing and getting more information. Mm -hmm. In the same way with remote viewing really, it's all about a step-by-step -step process. It's what you, let's say you have an image of a mountaintop with penguins on it. Well, you might draw a great sketch with a, you know, a mound or a peak, and that, you know, that's a nice depiction. That's mm -hmm. nice if you're just, you know, trying to impress some researchers who are looking at your, your session and comparing it to a photo. But again, if you're trying to find, um, you know, something on that mountaintop, then you're gonna need to get a lot more detail. Well, how do you do that? Because all you got was a mountain. Well, the techniques are you put your pen on that and you send your consciousness there. You look mm -hmm. at what's under your feet. You rise up and you look mm -hmm. down. You get more information. But a lot of people at that point want to st start interpreting. Mm -hmm. You know, they might be like, oh, there's these guys wearing tuxedos. Well, that's not correct. There's a life form wearing a, uh, in black and white. Mm -hmm. But as a train remote viewer, you understand, okay, my, my mind is thinking guys in, uh, wearing tuxedos, but that's probably probably not right. I have to set that aside. I'm going to go back into the session. I'm going to bring myself right to whatever that was and touch it mm -hmm. or smell it. What comes up next? Mm -hmm. And so it's a constant probing, exploring, getting your mind out of the way. And by the very end, then it's like, oh, those weren't people that they're flying. You know, mm -hmm. this is some kind of bird life form. So you have more and more accurate information, mm -hmm. but it's about guiding yourself.
So what you're describing are the, m many of the similarities between psychic yes. reading and remote viewing. W one of the important ones is getting your intellect out of the way completely. Exactly, and that's the hardest thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it is because we're taught from the time we grow up, but you know, we're taught to take our feelings, we're, we're babies and we're cr crying, we're upset, yeah. and the first thing our parents do is try to teach us teach us words and, and saying well why are you upset you know what what's going mm -hmm. on they want to bring everything to the intellect mm -hmm. so our intellect is, is what's and especially when it comes to now the remote viewing end of things and you know the people that uh, when at SRI you had these great thinkers I mean yes. people that whose br minds scientists, couldn't be yeah. <laughs> yeah, scientists you know and they're teaching psychic work and studying it and then you've got these military people that you know are men with not only great minds but really big egos mm -hmm. and you put that all together and so that lineage of, of psychic work is going to develop in a certain way with a certain language you know we were talking about they don't like to call themselves psychics right. and it starts to get confusing because they're saying well we're we're not being psychic here. They get embarrassed in, by that right. term. Right, because there's been negative connotations mm -hmm. or not even negative but you know they look at people in the spiritual realm who are talking about spirit guides and, and, and crystals and stuff like that and they don't want to have anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately um, it, it gets very confusing to both ends because they're, they're using different words that they mm -hmm. you know don't understand. I mean in, on the remote viewing end, um, you know, the terms anomalous cognition, right. you know, non-local perception. Mm -hmm. That What do these words mean to people on the other end of the spectrum who've never heard those words? It's We're thinking about chakras and auras and right. uh, reincarnation, past lives and spirit guides. Yeah, and you know, some of it is, again, what what is the focus? Mm -hmm. the, the focus is on one end is is exploring the universe and uh, the spirituality and not that rem remote viewers are very interested in in the universe and any of them who you talk to even the military guys you talk to mm. for a while and it becomes apparent that doing that work really did change them on a deep level mm -hmm. and they do tap into deeper spiritual work but the, a lot of them won't talk about those experiences because yeah. it you know it's they're already fighting for legitimacy within mm -hmm. within the field. Well, as a psychic reader, you kind of merge in a way with the person you're reading, don't you? Well, actually, many people do, but the the lineage of the um, Lewis Bostwick's work. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that it set, sets apart from other uh, work is that you're taught how to not merge, okay. and you're taught to have a space in between mm -hmm. yourself to be aware of where you are, the person you're reading, you are, and you're taught you don't have to merge. In fact, when you merge, it's more emotional, and mm -hmm. when any emotion can be distracting. Um, now, in remote viewing, actually, I found there's more of a merging that occurs at least for me mm -hmm. because when you're remote viewing you're actually sending yourself while remote viewers don't talk in terms of out of body or out of body travel um, they talk about maybe bringing your consciousness to the location mm -hmm. my sense of it is that I am going there and I am merging and I've actually gone to a location or at least you know again it's through intent and imagination so I'm imagining I'm going to that location mm -hmm. And I've had it where suddenly I felt a heart beating and I felt a, a body and heart beating like I was inside mm -hmm. and that told me, oh, there's a life form right here. And mm -hmm. that turned out to be what the target was, but I didn't know. In remote viewing, they don't <coughs> say you're reading a person. Um, the, a lot of times they'll just give you a target number, a random mm -hmm. number, so yep. you don't know you have no idea what the subject is, whereas in clairvoyant reading, you always know, oh, here's a person. You try not to, you try to have as little front loading as possible in both of them, mm -hmm. but in clairvoyant reading, you'll get at least a person's name. Now, let's define that term, front loading. Yes, so front loading is simply where you know information up front before you start. And uh, so in clairvoyant reading, you would know the person's name. Mm -hmm. You'd at least usually know, like if we're meeting, mm -hmm. um, you'll know what they look like. But most of my work over the last 10 years have been, has been over the phone. Mm -hmm. So usually I don't know anything more than their name. I know if they're male or female because I can tell from their name mm -hmm. or voice 
that's really about it. And um, but that is still information. So you don't have long-term clients who you know very well. Well, no, I, I do have long-term clients as well. Yeah. I, I have a lot of those. But as far as um, I, I have a lot of people that I'm meeting for the mm -hmm. first time. Mm -hmm. And when when I had a, an assistant, um, you know, I was really even more, you know, cut off from knowing anything. But mm -hmm. you know, now I might have their email address or something like that. But the um, the point is is that you try to have as little as information up front. Mm -hmm. Now with clairvoyant reading, again, because we're not trying to, this isn't for research, we're not trying to prove anything, we're trying to help people, we don't have to be as worried about that. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to research, you want to to have as little information up front as right. possible, uh, which in research terms is being blind to but the But the idea subject. of front loading, I think, is to keep the intellect out of it because if you have a little bit of information your intellect's going to try and mine that information right it'll it, it it will it can mislead you um for example if someone comes to you and they say um and, and i've had this happen i tell people tell me as little as possible about what you're you know say looking for mm -hmm. if someone comes up to you and says i lost my diamond ring i want you to find it and i think it might be in the kitchen but then the last time i saw it in the bathroom I mean, forget about it. You know, mm -hmm. the, what you're going to have to struggle with in the session to get all those ideas out. And those ideas, may, it may be nowhere in those places, mm -hmm. but there's so much you have to fight with that you just don't want that. Mm -hmm. Now, some remote viewers, like I, I personally like to know a lot. It's not that I need to, but I find it more efficient. If you tell me that you've lost your ring, that that's a good amount of information for me. Um, Joe McMonagall, who was a longtime viewer in the military, he doesn't even want to know that. And mm -hmm. he works with his wife and people contact her. She will write up a target number, he'll do the session. And then let's say in the case of a missing ring, if his session produces information about a ring, then he knows he's on, his, on the right track. And mm -hmm. then he'll go back in and retask himself, do another session. And this time it'll focus on the location. Mm -hmm. But for, for me, I've just found like, I don't have a problem working with at least knowing it's a ring or, you know, this this person has gone missing and just mm -hmm. having you know a first name or something like that I, yeah. I find it helpful but the the other reason you might want to know some front loading is for example my approach to working with a location is different than my approach to working with a single object mm -hmm. or my approach with if, if a researcher wants me to describe a photo as opposed to someone searching for a missing person the you know I, I might take 10 minutes to describe a photo mm -hmm. for a missing person I might take eight hours or I might oh. do several sessions during the course of a week mm -hmm. so I'm uh, knowing a little bit just helps me pull out of my tool bag what I want to use for that and how, how in depth mm -hmm. I'm going to go and the challenge is for remote viewers is we, we um, a lot of times since w we don't know if we've gotten enough information, mm -hmm. so we we have to kind of use our intuition to say, okay, I was in session for 45 minutes and this is long enough, you know, versus I'm going to stay in session for two more hours and get a lot more information when that may not be necessary. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have to feel it as you go along. Whereas with a person, you in clairvoyant reading you have an idea well you know there's you just have an idea of how much you've covered sometimes they're asking questions which again questions can be front-loading um, but they can also help you direct your attention yeah. because with all of this you could see all of this is time-consuming mm -hmm. you know and can you imagine if someone said they wanted you to write a paper but they didn't really um, or write an article but they didn't give you any guidelines you know you may end up doing hours long of writing that you don't really need to do so mm -hmm. in any task guidelines are helpful mm -hmm. but when it comes comes to research, parapsychology research, you have to be very careful that you, you know, just as far as being able to present it, because there's so many skeptics, you know, um, really tearing everything apart. So that's why it's really become part of the practice in remote viewing yeah. to do your work. You as want to make sure possible. you rule out any normal sources of inf information. Right. But now you mentioned a psychic reading, you separate yourself from your client. Yes, well, that's one of the techniques where you you attune yourself 
But at the same time, you see, like, I might visualize an object in between us, mm -hmm. and um, and I might ground, imagine a grounding cord grounding myself and, mm -hmm. and seeing your energy over there. And I can still pick up information about you, and I can feel mm -hmm. some things, but it's very different than if I merged if I merged with you, I might feel everything you're mm -hmm. feeling. And, you know, feeling is feeling is great. It can, if you have a stomach ache and I feel it, I can tell you that you have a stomach ache. Mm -hmm. You're feeling sad. And people say, well, if you already knows, then why do you have to say that? But it's a very profound experience for one person to witness what the other person is and, and express that. And sometimes people don't really know how they're, like you might be stressed but not aware that, or you might be overthinking and I might say, well, gosh, you know, I'm feeling some anxiety and you're like, oh, I don't think I'm anxious. And then you you kind of feel it and it's like, oh my gosh, that's oh, why no. I haven't slept, you know, for a week. So that can be helpful, but beyond that, that's so limiting, mm -hmm. you know, then we need to understand, well, well, why are you anxious? Uh, how are you approaching your work in your life that's not working for you? And what are the obstacles and how can you get over that? And none of that is going to work just from me feeling what you're feeling. In mm -hmm. fact, if I'm, feelings are like being in a tornado. And if I stay in that, or if, I, if, if I'm feeling your stomach ache and I don't know how to separate from that, mm -hmm. my session is just going to, you know, I'm mm -hmm. going to have to end the session and go take a nap or take some medication. So would you say more preparation is required? required to do a psychic reading than to do a remote viewing? Well, I would say I tend to do more preparation. Um, I find with my remote viewing sessions, if I go into too deep of a state, I fall asleep. So there's a fine balance with with um, my, I just call it my brainwave switching over. You know, yeah. it's a fine, um, it's a fine line, so I can't be in a too deep a state, but mm -hmm. I have to, I, it seems like with remote viewing, I want to be a little bit more alert. But again, with remote viewing, I do feel it's energetically more messy because mm -hmm. I'm going to the places, I have a harder time separating, especially, you know, with reading a person, I'm with them for an hour, hour and a half, and as when we're done, we're done. There's mm -hmm. usually no great mystery. Uh, I have a very firm uh, uh, rules for myself that I just won't think about them again. Mm -hmm. But with the remote viewing session again, let's say I do an hour-long session and I don't get any feedback because a lot of times you may not get feedback, um, maybe sometimes ever, or mm -hmm. maybe you know the researcher isn't giving it to you for months. So then I will go to sleep at night and I'll be like, gosh, did, did I miss something? You mm -hmm. know, maybe I should do another session mm -hmm. because maybe there's more I can get. Or in the case of like a, a missing girl last week, mm -hmm. I was working on that and it was, you know, missing people are a challenge because they can move around. You know, what you mm -hmm. see the first day might be different the second and mm -hmm. the third. So I was connected with this girl. I had, I had a sense she would return home, but I, I just felt like there was more I could be doing. And so I stayed connected. Mm -hmm. I stayed connected with her and it was really not a very fun week mm -hmm. and I didn't sleep well. Fortunately, she got home and then I used the techniques that I had learned in my clairvoyant training to help me f make that final separation. Uh, but had I just gone through remote viewing training, they don't teach that, mm -hmm. you know, because you're not supposed to talk about clearing your, your chakras or mm -hmm. clearing your aura. So that's not part of remote viewing training. Right. So that's that doesn't sound very scientific. So I was able to use what I learned in my clairvoyant training to, to bring my energy away from that mm -hmm. missing girl who is still, she, she's okay, but she's still having yeah. psychological issues. So I don't want to keep that connection mm -hmm. going. Deb Lynn Katz. We've gone for half an hour. We've pretty much used up our time, but this conversation is so engrossing. If you're willing, I'd like to do another program and we'll keep going on this topic. I would love that. Thank okay. You. Thank you so much for being with me. And thank you for being with us. Be sure to check your listings for part two of our two-part series on remote viewing and clairvoyant reading. Thank you.